very good, very positive, much more than I thought it would go. It would be. People are interested in this. People are worried. They want to stop mosques. They want to stop mosques for the point of, from the point of view of the benefit of the country as a whole and also from the point of view of the benefit of their individual neighbourhoods. It's not something they want to see. They need legal help. They need protection. They are not getting it from their political elites, so they have to do it for themselves. I'm surprised how positively it has been received. But really at the moment what I'm waiting for is for the, uh, the, the new cases to come through the pipeline. At the moment what people are doing is telling me about these awful cases of mosques being granted planning permission, sometimes without people being consulted properly, and they find that there's a new mosque landed on their doorstep and there's nothing they can do about it. I need to be told at the beginning, as soon as the application comes in, then I can help people to get up a campaign, then I can help people to, uh, uh, to resist it, I can help them to streamline their campaign and make it effective. So if anyone out there knows about an application for a new mosque, a cultural centre, some phony um, community centre or some multi-faith interfaith harmony institute or a school or a college, they should let me know. Oh yeah, it's very seldom that a mosque outfit will put forward a mosque calling it a mosque. They will always try and say it's for the benefit of the community, it's, for, it's a prayer room, it's a community centre for all faiths, for all ethnicities. No, it's not. It's going to be a mosque. And if you disobey any part of Islamic law whilst you're on the premises, you'd better look out. It, they go under all kinds of names and local authorities lap it up because local authorities are afraid to nullify the politically correct gravy train that they're riding. It's good business for them. And things go through under all kinds of euphemisms. But they are mosques. Yeah, ab absolutely. The causes of this, the, or the cause, the prime root cause of this is Islamic doctrine and the police, as, for as long as the police fail to recognise that, they will not be able to address this crime properly. They may be able to prune it back occasionally, they won't be able to cut the root of it. They might be able to disrupt it, they might be able to ensure that the people who are doing it get a little bit cleverer and uh, manage to do it under the radar and avoid arrest for a little bit longer. They won't be able to deal with the underlying cause, which is Islamic doctrine. Two reasons. The first reason is that Islamic doctrine permits, encourages and to a certain extent mandates Muslim men to take non-Muslim women as slaves, as slaves to be used for sex. And, 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 and Muhammad did it, Muhammad's followers did it, Muhammad praised his followers for doing it. The Quran says repeatedly that there are two classes of people that a Muslim man can have sex with. Firstly, his wives. He can have four of them. Secondly, his sex slaves. And he can have as many of them as he wants. Uh, and uh, that is the first reason. The second reason is that Islamic doctrine, again, permits, encourages, and to a certain extent mandates Muslim men to have sex with underage girls. Muhammad, who is the pattern for Muslim for followers of Islam for all time, the perfect man, the template for Muslim behaviour. He did it. His, quote, favourite wife was six when he married her. She was nine and still playing with dolls when he had sex with her. And playing with dolls signifies that she had not yet reached puberty because dolls are human images. That's idolatry. It's forbidden in Islam, but there is an exception so that it is allowed for little girls who have not yet reached puberty. And Aisha, when she was nine and still playing with dolls, uh, had sex, or Muhammad had sex with, with her then. The Quran also states that it is permissible for a Muslim man to marry, have sex with, and then divorce a girl all before she reaches puberty. So before she reaches adolescence, he can do all those things with her and then get rid of her. And if you take those two things together, and, and the, the Islamic doctrine that it is okay to have sex with underage girls, and if you put those two things together, you get the crimes that we are seeing now. Two, two developments that are in the, in, in the press recently. First of all, a case in Stafford of nine Muslim men preying upon, grooming and abducting and using as sex slaves, or, or as the prosecution put it, uh, using the, those girls as sexual commodities to be sold or gifted for their own sexual gratification or for money. The second development is a series of raids across Greater Manchester targeting what looks like about a dozen properties, arresting reportedly at least 
10 men and rescuing quote, dozens of girls. These are girls aged 13 and upward who are being used for sexual slavery. Now, the, the, the reports don't mention the religious background, but they do say that this is part of a police campaign to deal with, uh, the, to tackle the habit of Muslim men uh, grooming a, and uh, uh, um, enslaving uh, un underage girls, using them as, as underage uh, prostitutes. And uh, one detective in the area has described this as a tidal wave of offending. Yeah, this is, this is very important, and it is very important that mosques are stopped. I just want to deal with that first of all. Mosques play a vital role. They are the central role in the advancement and the propagation of Islamic doctrine. Islamic doctrine is the problem here with the rape and underage exploit, the, the, and the exploitation and, and pimping of underage girls. And Islamic doctrine is advanced in mosques. In order to stop Islamic doctrine, which is the root of this problem, you have to prevent further mosques from being built. Crucially, you have to prevent them from getting started, from getting planning permission in the first place. If people want to help, please contact me. If you hear, if you want to do something about this, tell me when you hear about a planning application for a new mosque, a planning application for a new supposedly multi-faith community centre or cultural centre or a school or college. Tell me ab about them and I will give you the legal help that you need in order to resist such applications for MOSS in, in your area. I'm a lawyer, a planning lawyer. I deal with planning permissions. That's my job. I will help you. I will help you get up your campaign. I will help you to streamline it and make it effective. Please contact me. I will stand by you. Right, the number one effective way, the most direct way, is for people, ordinary people, to telephone their local authorities every week, every fortnight, and ask, is there a planning application for a mosque? Is there a planning application for a cultural centre or something like a mosque? Some Islamic institution in our area, has it been submitted this week or in the last fortnight? And to do that regularly, you're entitled to do it. The local authority may be sniffy about it, but they are not allowed to deny you the information. You can make, a, if, they, if they do deny you the information, you can make a freedom of information re request. You pay them, you're entitled to know. What I want, what's most important, what I really want, is to get an army of people, about 500 people across the country, who do that. It doesn't cost anything, it's not an awful lot of work, but people who will contact local authorities and find out the applications that have been made at an early stage. What application has been submitted in the last week or fortnight, and then tell me, and then I can go into action and help them, first of all, to get up their campaign, and secondly, to make sure that it is effective and that these mosque applications are resisted. Uh, local, local authority means council, borough council, district council or city council. Not county council, but the councils that deal with planning permissions. That's your local council, the one that collects your bins, the one that you pay council tax to. That's your council. Contact them and ask them. And then please contact me about it. You can go to my website, which is uh, lawandfreedomfoundation.org and you can email me from there. First thing is to prevent the building of new mosques in order to prevent the propagation of Islamic doctrine which is at the root of this. The second thing, it is often said that you are not allowed to take the law into your own hands. English law specifically allows English men and women to do so to the extent that they use reasonable force in order to prevent a crime. Uh, uh, um, common law allows that, statute law allows that. Section 3 of the Criminal Law Act 1967, you can use reasonable force to prevent a crime. The, the question about that is what is reasonable force? What constitutes reasonable force? What the government should do and what I would, for what it's worth, what I would invite them to do is, is to clarify that issue and they should specify by legislation if necessary that lethal force is reasonable force when it comes to preventing this dangerous, explosive and unspeakable crime. We will accomplish this. We will not allow our self-serving elites to let us down. Every politician, every councillor, every council officer will jump to inform themselves of the law. They are aiding and abetting a, 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 an ideology, a religion, which is contrary to English 
criminal law. It is contrary to incitement law. It's contrary to public order law. It's contrary to hate speech law. By, by aiding and abetting the establishment of new mosques, they are aiding and abetting something that is outside the criminal law. They have no power to do so. They need to know, they need to take advice as to what their legal position is and how they are exposed. They have a choice to make and we will force them to make it.